All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the CX Chronicles podcast. Super excited. Fred Reichheld, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. So, Fred, why don't you start off today's uh, episode as we start off all these shows? I'd love for you to just set the stage, my friend. Um, why, don't you, why don't you take a couple minutes to tell the CX Nation a little bit about your background, a little bit about some of the experiences that you've had over the last 40 years, and, um, and why don't you just kind of give us a sense for sort of how you got into the type of work that you've been doing now for, for, for the last several decades? I joined uh, Bain back in the late 1970s and uh, early on started, uh, ran, ran across businesses that were performing far better than you'd expect them to based on the economics and the strategy principles that I'd learned in business school and in my early days at Bain. And, and over time, I came to recognize, and these companies were little and large, high-tech, low-tech, but the common theme was that they were earning enormous loyalty from their customers and employees. Um, and, and that led me down this path of thinking that, you know, most business people actually have the wrong mindset. They think business is about profits. And I see that these companies that are actually succeeding and earning the greatest return to their investors over the years, they believe the purpose of the business is to make their customers' lives better. And that they're either they have great intuitive leaders and increasingly developing measures and processes and tools and so forth that are customer focused when in fact what most businesses run on today are financial oriented measures and they they promote a financial mindset and i think it's basically wrong um we did a, a survey very recently with 200 executives of large companies around the world and asked them what's the primary purpose your business exists hmm. And only 10% said it was to make our customers' lives better. Wow. Most of them said it was to maximize shareholder return, uh, make this a great place to work, or some balanced duty to everybody equally, which is a black hole of nothingness in my opinion. <laughs> but the idea that 10, only 10% of today's leaders think customers come first you go oh my lord my That's life's scary. worked 40 years and i've only come this far <laughs> i think i think it speaks volumes to the fact that we might be paying certain uh, certain talent pools too much money if that's the only focus i think i know there's a ton of work out there around some of the stuff but you're right fred it's like man like most people most entrepreneurs most founders most people that spend their lives building their businesses man, they had a problem or they had a, a niche thing that they just, they couldn't like, they, it was like a, uh, a niche that they just kept scratching and scratching. And then over time and over, 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 over grittiness and over trying to work it out again and again and again, they figure out a solution that a ton of people ha have, have a similar problem with. And then they can, so to your point, most traditional founders and entrepreneurs, they're literally building and, and, and starting the bonfire with an end user in mind, with a customer in mind, with a potential customer in mind and trying to figure something out. So it's incredible to see that it's unfortunate. I, I hate to say it, but it's incredible to see that it's that small of a percentage of, of today's leaders that are thinking about customer and just customer and employees. The first thing that should be coming out of their mouths, you'd think. I think entrepreneurs uh, understand this usually because you just can't afford to cheat. You can't unless you get monstrous amounts of money from venture capitalists and then wasted on acquiring customers, um, most people get it. In fact, the story that Andy Taylor at Enterprise Rent-A-Car told me decades ago, when it was still a, a relatively modest company, you know, today Enterprise is the biggest car rental company on earth. Yep. Big fixed cost business with tons of uh, cars in their fleet. He's, but he said, Fred, you know, we've, we're a private company. We've, it's capital intensive, but we have generated enough cash because we have this core principle that, that works when you're tiny. It works when you're 20 billion in revenues. It, you, you've got to treat your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. Yep. And yep. that simple idea is the flywheel behind almost all great business successes and certainly all great companies. But almost none of our measurement systems are based on that. Um, it, you ask, a, ask a typical business, not a, tie, not a small entrepreneur, but ask a big business. Um, how much of your business did you get from uh, new customers this year versus those that have been with you previously? 
And they can't, they, they don't know that right out. They have to go to their analysts and figure <laughs> that out. And then you ask them of your new business, how much of that came primarily through referral and reputation as opposed to buying it through um, sales and advertising and so on. And they have no clue. Yeah. They can't measure that. And so yeah. this idea, the Andy Taylor, brilliantly simple idea, treat your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. Most businesses cannot measure that today and they have no concept of whether they're making progress or falling back. And it's, it just boggles my mind. We've solved that finally. I yeah. thought, you know, the initial solution was net promoter score. Um, if the core of the central objective is treating customers so come back for more and bring their friends, the highest standard is not coming back for more. That's just, sometimes that's lazy. Yeah. Or if you bought somebody's software, it's a lot easier just to keep using it. Yep. Um, but it's a higher standard to recommend it to a friend. Because that means if you were starting over today, who has the best solution? And so the reason how likely you'd recommend to a friend is the core of the net promoter solution is that is the high standard. Are you treating people so well that they want that for a loved one, for a friend or a family member? And that high standard is survey-based, which has its own weaknesses, but at least it's measuring what's the truth behind great business. Big time. Now, now you run into people, well, we're going to pay our people based on that promoter score. And that's just bogus. It's the <laughs> stupidest idea I have ever seen. I, and yet most companies do it. And, and I might do it. If I were leading a business, big business, and I knew that Andy Taylor was right, and this net promoter score, that seems like the best thing I've seen that's close to it. But don't pay people on surveys. I mean, you can pay CEOs and the C-suite on surveys, because then you can get panels and you can do it right. But when you're paying people at the front lines uh, and holding them accountable for the people they touch, that just makes them care about the score more than about the person they're serving. Yep. And so instead of really trying to learn how to get better, they get all incensed about, oh, it's not a perfect score. And there's, look, that guy, you know, he meant to give me a 10, but he gave me a one and, yep. uh, and they waste their time. So how do you stop that? Well, I tried preaching for years and failed. <laughs> and so now I think with this new book, Winning on Purpose, we are delivering a new metric that is correct for holding people accountable. And it's the perfect twin metric to net promoter score. But because it's accounting based, we call it earned growth rate. It's based on the accounting results of customers coming back for more and bringing their friends and you know measuring that in a rigorous way. So I think we may have the, solved this issue that I've struggled with for more than a decade. I love it. I love it, Fred. So a couple of things, a couple of things to immediately jump into. So number one, um, you know, creating a measure like the net promoter score, especially for folks listening to this show. So you're, you're in a, you're in a good, a good audience right now, Fred, because a lot of our folks are, they're the guys and gals that are running customer experience, customer support, customer uh, mm -hmm. success teams, right? And NPS is a huge part of our game. Number one, we're probably some of the biggest believers in most organizations of everything that you just said, right? Which is like the easiest way for our jobs to, not only for us to knock it out of the park mm -hmm. with our jobs, but to grow our book of business, to continue to stabilize our customer portfolio, better yet, to continue to grow our customer portfolio year over year over year, we got to be having a stable of promoters who not only love the work that, that we do as, as, as customer facing agents, but more importantly, like the business that we're, that we're the, we're the, um, you know, that we, we we're, 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 we're owning, right. We have to be the people that are, are always thinking about how we can do better, how we can do more, how we can be listening for what types of things they need more of. But the last part is this, Fred, um, when you talk about likeliness of recommending a business or a product or a service to a friend or to a family member, like you just nailed it, man. It's like not enough people break it down to that simple point of understanding. Like the reason why we're here is to create something that people love, something that people want to come back to, something that people want to go recommend. And I think uh, last point, you just nailed it. I am blown away by how many growth focused companies, specifically in the venture capital world, they don't take the time to simply ask their existing customers. So let's, whatever the business I mean, they might have hundreds of customers, they might have thousands of customers. It is amazing, Fred, how many companies I interact, I interact with that they don't simply ask for referrals. They don't ask for reviews. They don't ask for some of the feedback that theoretically becomes tomorrow's fuel for optimization, tomorrow's fuel for continuous improvement. And then getting back to our, our, our executive friends, 
That's the stuff that drives growth. That's the stuff that drives revenue. And that's the stuff that over time, if we're, if we're, if we're paying attention to it, can improve all of our financial measures, right? And make everybody happy. So it's super, super important stuff in every single business, regardless of the size. Well, and that's also what inspires good employees. Uh, when, you, when you make someone's life so much better that a customer feels compelled to go out and recommend it to all their friends, because not to help you, maybe a little bit to help you, but mostly because they want that great experience for their friends and loved ones, that, that, that makes the employees feel proud yep. and, and energized. And, you know, a lot of people, this great place to work movement, it's well-intentioned, but gosh, you know, your leaders don't make it a great place to work. It's your customers that make it a great place to work. If your customers love what you're doing for them and they've got a monstrous problem that you're solving and making their life better, that is the core of a meaningful, purposeful existence. And yeah. that's what most, I mean, every employee wants to make a good, you know, you want to earn a living and have health care, but that's a low standard. Everyone should get that. What makes it a great place to work is, playing a valued role on a on a team that that is winning with its customers and and turning frowns into smiles that's what makes the world a better place 100 percent agree it's like there's this whole movement of companies that focus on their customer experience and then equally invest and focus on their employee experience these are companies that are killing it fred these are companies that are growing up into the right year over year these are companies that are creating armies of promoters, right? Just which, which again, makes, makes business a lot more fun. Number one, just call it out. It makes it more fun. You just nailed it. Like if you got customers that love you and it's a joy for every interaction or every time you're, you're, you're talking with a business or a brand, it's, it's good. It's positive. That stuff's fun. We've all been in the opposite, right? We've all been in businesses or we've all worked with clients or we've all been in situations where when that's not the case, man, you won't, everyone's got a different appetite for that type of stress. And everyone's got a different type of bandwidth for how much of that they can take. Well, let's call it what it is. Even the best in the world, that stuff gets old after a while. Unhappy customers equals unhappy employees over time. And frankly, I, I, and you probably know way more about this than me, but statistically, those are the businesses that tend to fail, or those are the businesses that show us over time that that they don't have some of that sustainability and they don't have that ability to go decade after decade after decade as they grow into the future. Yeah, I think one of the things that will be helpful to your audience in the book is I've, hit, I've put it in several chapters, but it's, it's more and more evidence that as we measure net promoter score rigorously, consistently, apples to apples, across competitors in an industry, we're finding that those with the highest net promoter scores are delivering the best total shareholder return to their investors over the last decade. Um, we took all, it, as evidence, we took all of the companies I wrote about in the Ultimate Question 2.0, as exemplars and NPS winners, and looked at those over the decades since that book came out, and their total shareholder returns were triple that mm. of the market. Wow! So, and and I'm I'm one of those one of the things at Bain, you tend to put your money where your mouth is. So I started <laughs> investing. I invested in all the NPS leaders. Okay. Uh, that I could, uh, and uh, and I did more than triple the market over the decade. Wow! It, it, it has made me very wealthy in most people. <laughs> and and yet that common sense of Andy Taylor and the evidence that my investment strategy I call it the frenzy the, the foster recommendation <laughs> eliminate the traction that's Fred yeah. and the stock index so frenzy okay. I like that frenzy Wait, where do we is, find this frenzy list where is this public <laughs> well that, that's that's chapter two of uh, <laughs> of my book good you look okay. at winning in purpose you're going to see the frenzy and how we calculate it and it, it's, it's open to everybody. So I, I, some people are saying, Fred, is this a book about customer experience or inspiring uh, employees? Or is this really about a, a moral existence of love thy neighbor as thyself? Or is this about getting rich in the stock market? Well, it, it's really all those things because they're all connected. Yeah, they are. They absolutely are. Um, Fred, I, I, before we jump into, into the pillars, I'd love to ask, you know, when you were thinking about some of the initial ideas with how you could build that promoter, how you could build the scoring, how you could get people to use it and adopt it. What did that whole, what did that whole phase look like? Was what, what I'd love to just understand sort of like at that point in your life and at that point in your career, what, what brought you to that specific type of place? And then how the hell did you get so many people across the world 
to adopt and to and, and to utilize this this methodology for 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 decades now. Well, I I'm not a wizard marketer, so it wasn't my you know I I wasn't out there beating the drum. I think there's a basic truth that I probably captured with it. And everyone knows in their heart, they, they want to love their neighbor, they love loving your customers, the unbeatable strategy. Um, and I just, I gave enough economic evidence that it works. All right, Fred. <clears throat> All right. So Fred, I'd love to, I'd love to jump into the first CX pillar of team. You've had just some incredible experiences working at Bain, working with all these different clients and all these different customers across the world, meeting with all these different executives. I'd love for you to just spend a couple minutes talking about what are some of the things that really kind of jump out to you when you're thinking about that first pillar of team that tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's founders, tomorrow's executives need to be thinking about when it comes to, to building their team, leading their team, and really kind of thinking about investing their team in the future. Yeah, I think the most uh, important thing to remember as a leader is that leaders don't make teams happy, customers make them happy because they spend a lot more of their time interacting with customers than they do with the boss. Big time. So the job of a good boss, a leader, is to put their team in a position where they, the team can earn standing ovations from customers and hear them and share them. But that's one of the things that Net Promoter does so effectively is when you get a 10 from a customer and they have a verbatim explaining why, it's the perfect thing to share in a huddle or to share uh, in coaching sessions. And it, it's, it's like a free bonus. It, it energizes teams. It's the core of why good people work. I think the other issue is um, the, the leader does have to be thoughtful about making it a great place to work. Because in this day and age where the great resignation is taking place and, yeah, right. and employees are rethinking what they want to do with their lives and what their purpose is, um, you got to make sure this is a great place. And, and so many of the, the uh, practitioners in the net promoter community have applied net promoter feedback to employees and asked them how likely you'd recommend this is a great place to work, zero through 10. And that's, a, that's exactly the right question. And then the verbatim, you know, why? And some, I don't like long surveys, but I will take them up to three questions. The, the third question it is, is there anything we could, uh, what could we do better? Yep. And, and getting that and treating it seriously and taking action on it is how you drive a, a self-managing workforce who does have to step back, think about what needs to change to make it better and, and help you take action on that. But in, in the long run, unless you inspire teams to innovate and to love their customers, if they don't feel the trust to do the right thing for customers always that you've got their back, then they'll stop doing it. They'll stop yep. worrying about what kind of score they get and, and not getting in trouble. And that destroys the innovation and energy of a, of a team. So I think this net promoter philosophy is, you know, people, some people think, Oh, it's customer based. Well, yes, but it's, it's the recognition that teams will only be happy if they are making customers happy. And then you got to do everything you can to make that system uh, uh, work well. I, I couldn't agree more, Fred. I, I, I promise you at CXC, we do a ton of work with ENPS or Employee Net Promoter because of exactly what you just said. Number one, it's, it's an easy way to capture what the general voice of the employee. There's all this work and all this, all this content and all this information out there right now. VOC, voice of customer, super duper hot. Voice of employee is the same type of reporting. It's the same type of data collection. It's the same type of data assessment. And frankly, your ability to report and your ability to just show either managing up to your executive team or managing down throughout the entire organization, what the general voice of the employee is. I think in, in today's world, especially post COVID and especially to your point with, with, with like the great resignation, there's 40% of employed people are looking for new jobs or ready to take a new job tomorrow. That is huge. It's just become, I think I would, I would take it a step further and say it has just become mandatory. I think that executive teams across the world, the same way that they've thought about and invested and measured and managed all of the voice of customer uh, items that, 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 that people like you and I think about every single day, they're going to have to be doing the exact same thing on the voice of the employee. And I think you're going to see a lot more VOE reporting and a lot more uh, socialization of how you can actually improve 
your OKRs, improve your prioritization of said activities across the organization, and then most importantly, improve your ability to socialize this stuff. Like it's not always on the executive team to, 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 to socialize this stuff. Sometimes it's as easy as see what the hundred teammates think, put it into some cool reporting, socialize that reporting. Now the whole business understands sort of where people are kind of lining up and what they're thinking about. So I love that idea. Yeah, Bain is a really good case study. There's an entire chapter in Winning on Purpose and how Bain went from almost bankruptcy in, in the early 90s to become what many people think is the great best place to work in the world. At least Glassdoor, which measures this uh, great place to work. Um, Bain is number one this year. It's been number one, I think, four times in the last decade is one of the top several the only company in the world to be in the top several for this long stretch. And so I sort of open up the kimono and, and explain how it is we went from disaster to, to today. And it's at the core, it's a set of tools and processes about helping leaders recognize their real duty is to help teams improve customers' lives and, and customer results. We, um, uh, I told you early in the interview, we, we did a survey of business leaders around the world and asked them, what's the primary reason your business exists? Only 10% said was to improve the lives of their customers. At Bain, across all our employees, six, over 60% say the reason our business exists is to make our, 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 our customers' lives better. And, and that's what makes it a great place to work. Yep. <laughs> and yep. that's the reinforcing cycle. Yep, I love it. Um, Fred, I'd love to jump into the second CX pillar of tools. So again, over, over your career, you've worked with all these different businesses. I'm sure you've seen uh, a plethora of incredible toolkits. And then at Bain, Bain's got some, some, some incredible tools that, that, that have allowed them to grow into the position that they are today. I'd love to, for you to spend a couple of minutes just talking about some of the things that you have kind of picked up along your journey around tools. And what are maybe two or three big areas that you'd want the listener to think about as they're building their business, building their team, leading their team, what are two or three big things that you'd want them thinking about and remain focused on when it comes to tools? Well, in net promoter in itself, you can think of as a tool. It's a way Absolutely. of constantly gauging how many lives you're enriching, how many diminishing and, and closing a loop on what you're going to do about that. I think that that's fundamental for, for customers and employees, regular huddles to make that the central conversation. Most huddles today are talking about sales targets and cost targets. Man, that stuff will take care of itself, given how it's wired into people's DNA and their accountability. What you need to talk about is, are we living up to the golden rule? What are we doing that is not in our customer's best interest? What do we need to change to make this become a great place to work? And uh, it's, it's doing that daily, weekly, monthly. Inserted into that, I think you got to make sure you have the frontline lead, the right frontline leaders. And there, Bain has done something radical. We, we vote uh, upward in a very carefully anonymized way. And we let people say uh, every six months, how likely, you know, do they want to work with this guy again or this lady again? And, and uh, how would they recommend this as a great place to work? Those feedback scores really determine the eligibility of someone to get promoted at Bain. Mm. And, and since there are lots of layers at Bain, you really can't get to a senior level unless the teams who have been working with you day in, day out, think you are something special in terms of helping them live the right life and live the values uh, of and, 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 and making customers succeed. That little device sort of guarantees you don't get sociopaths running companies. Yeah. And it seems like a small thing, but that's actually where I think there's a, a non-trivial number of businesses that are run by very selfish, bully takers, sociopaths that yep. really don't love their teams. They love profits and they love the, the spectacle of success. And man, you're not going to be a great company if you let that happen. Totally. I think we, we sort of let that happen in the early years at Bain and, and fixed it, which saved us. So think very seriously about don't just think because we do 360 interviews that that actually, man, it's just way too risky to say something bad about your boss. Uh, and do you trust your HR department to never let what you said about that woman 
get back to her when she's in a position of power. So 360 is a good idea, but it takes a rigorous process around it to make it true, where you can speak truth to power. And you got to have that in a, in a business. And, you know, doing it wrong can destroy it because anonymous is all these crazy people on Twitter who say evil, nasty things and make, uh, make it a horrible world. So you kind of have this structured anonymity. So the right people give the right feedback with the right intentions um, on the right basis and then link that hardwire it into who gets promoted and, and, uh, and gets recognized for their uh, achievements. You know, Fred, you bring up a super interesting point because I, I know this is a conversation that I have regularly. People will ask uh, as we're helping clients or working with clients on either survey optimization or survey construction or survey deployment or, or even just helping with, with, with increasing survey conversion rates. This question comes up all the time. Adrian, what do you do? We Should we be asking explicitly for who this person is or should we leave it anonymous? We, I think we should leave it anonymous. And it's funny that you say this because I know that there, 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 you know, there's, there's a number of different ways you can do anything in life. Um, but sometimes I, I couldn't agree more with you, what you said with some of these surveys, when they're anonymous, you're allowing people to hide behind uh, a number one, a bit of a cloak, right? You're, they're, they're hiding behind the screen and they're kind of, you, you just now that whether it's, whether it's hateful or un, not constructive, it, it's not helpful. It's really more just, just, just kind of poking or stabbing at a business or at a person, or maybe even a team that typically customer support teams are, are one of the biggest, one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, people that we're talking about right here, they're constantly getting, getting bashed. But I, I think you, you're right, man, when you, when, when you remove that cloak and it's very clear who the person is or what type of customer segment it is, or better yet internally, if we're talking about our employee feedback and our employee experience right now, the 360 point I think is super interesting because I think that number one, part of building an incredible customer experience and employee experience, you, there is candor required there. You need to be candid with your team there needs to be visibility, transparency, and communication, both with, with your bosses and with your doers, the people that are doing stuff. And I do think that there's, there's a ton of gains that comes from that. But here's the thing that people don't often realize. You're getting a gain to the CX when you're doing some of that internal type of um, uh, audits and reviews. Meaning like, there, there's, there, I've been a part of some 360s where by getting some of that stuff out under the table, whether it's a, a, a boss doing things that doesn't that a team doesn't like, or maybe it's a maybe it's a team or department doing things that the organization doesn't like, you can get improvement. You can make improvement from that stuff, and there there are gains that 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 any business or any any team listening can can can, can take right into their own business and really kind of run forward with it. Um, I, I would love to ask you though, you you mentioned and you started to to, to hit on this with Bain with process, but. Are there some ideas, Fred, around ways that you can kind of keep a simple, clean, easy process around how to think about whether it's your internal feedback for your employees or your external feedback if it's your customers? Are there a couple ideas around how you would think about managing that process for feedback to make sure that you're able to capture it and, you, and use it effectively? Well, I'd make sure that uh, there is as little anonymity as you can get away with and still ensure uh, fear and favor, not uh, overwhelming the the feedback, and it's it's different in every situation. So I think you have to be thoughtful. If it's a patient giving feedback to a doctor who's going to be operating on them, it's a little bit hard to to say exactly. You know, you, you don't want that guy angry with you, or or your <laughs> dentist, uh, or your mortgage banker before you right. get your mortgage. So it's a little different when there's the power situations reversed. You know, if it's credit card company and you got five cards, you know, you'll, you'll tell them what you really think. Um, but for your industry and for that position, you try to get as little anonymity as, as, as necessary as required and then close the loop with every failure. When, when someone gives you a detractor score, don't let that slide by somebody with some authority has to get back in touch and say, sorry, we screwed up here. What, how can we make it better? Because otherwise, they, somebody took a survey, told you you suck, and you yep. don't do anything. And it says, they don't even care that I think they suck. Yep. Um, that's the ultimate yep. slap on the face. Now, I think those need to be augmented with true anonymous systems. But an anonymity is not the core. It's when, when it's, there's just no other way. And I think a brilliant 
uh, thing to consider is what Airbnb has done. They have feedback that is available to everybody, including Big Brother, the, the Airbnb. And then there's private feedback where you can, as a guest, you can talk to the host and say, hey, listen, that table leg wobbled. You might want to fix that. You don't want to get the host <laughs> in trouble or, or really make that a huge issue for the public site. So there are different channels that are thoughtfully constructed, anonymous, partially anonymous, um, totally open. It's, 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 it's an awesome example. I think, you know, with Airbnb, Uber's another one, Fred, right? Like whether yeah. you're a driver or whether you're a rider, there's like this open, uh, this open view <laughs> around whether you're a good participant of that platform or not, man, it'd be phenomenal for, for more and more companies, especially post COVID when, when I'm a hundred percent with you, Fred, this is the time of customer centricity. This is the era of businesses that are going to push forward 50 years into the future, they're going to be customer centric and they're going to be employee centric. I'm, 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 I'm quite certain of that. Um, but man, the one thing that they've done that's so interesting and all of us should be thinking about within our own businesses and within our, our own customer <laughs> portfolios, how could we take some of that, that magic that Airbnb or Uber or Lyft has done where you really, in effect, you've got like marketplace feedback and marketplace metrics that essentially tells the entire marketplace whether or not you're a good participant or a bad participant. And they've, they've done a great way of simplifying the way that you do the count. And they've done a great way of yeah. showing the publicized reviews or showing some of the feedback around it, but, 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 but couldn't agree more. It's, 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 it's an incredible way of really kind of capturing and highlighting what's, what's, what the reality is, frankly, what the, what the reality is. If you see a hundred people talking about a driver being crazy or a driver having a dirty car, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. It's probably real. Just like our reviews and just like MPS and, and some of the other, other, other counts that we're thinking about. But the problem of even with an Uber, um, and I'm sure Lyft has a similar issue, when the public starts to know that, you know, on this five point scale, uh, drivers with a below a 4.6 basically get fired. They, uh, they have a chance to fix it and get training, but they're, they're dropped from the platform. So at 4.6, that means anything less than a five is a failing grade for that driver. Do you want him to lose his job or her job? Well, not usually. Sometimes it's that bad. So uh, these systems can catch the criminals, but they really don't help you distinguish between mediocre and good and great. Uh, and, and that's actually where a good business is trying to learn, is moving from good to great. So I, I heard a story a friend told me, he said, you know, I, I, gave a, I got an Uber ride. Um, perfectly fine ride. I uh, was getting out of the car and I, I remembered I forgot my hat. So I leaned back in and I saw the guy was giving me, he gave me a two as a customer. And I said, you know, why? The guy said, oh, you were fine. We're just trying to make a point with the guys at Uber that uh, the drivers um, really aren't happy. And, and so. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's These systems can be bad manipulated or, or, or you know or, so you get yeah. car dealers begging for tens and you know give the guy a 10 it was a horrible experience but it wasn't his fault it was his boss's fault and you don't want him to lose his job or get in trouble so you just destroy the effectiveness of these systems and in phone centers it's really bad usually the, the person gives you a, a low score because of something somebody other department did yep. or the product failed yep not because they weren't treated with dignity and respect on the phone so these poor people in the phone centers are being held accountable to a net promoter score which makes them hate it appropriately <laughs> but it's not net promoter score it's a net promoter score being badly implemented and one point i make in the book 90% of companies using Net Promoter do a crappy job. 100%. They, they are just getting a tiny fraction of the, of the upside. And I, I'm one of the major goals of this book is to try and fix that. You, you know, Fred, I, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that one of the, the, the big parts of the work that we do with our clients at CX Chronicles, it's literally MPS cleanup or it's MPS optimization where we'll come into a business, we'll see... You know, uh, Adrian, we've been capturing NPS for five years now. We've got, you know, 2,070 responses. And then we'll start looking at some of it. Not only are they doing counts incorrectly, but then they don't take some of the additional steps that you can take from 
uh, a data hygiene perspective where you think about segmentation, you think about creating cohorts, you understand what these different groups look like over time. You can begin to compartmentalize your reporting based on maybe maybe the year one group versus this year's group. And you can start to look, or maybe, maybe if your segments are, you know, you're serving your enterprise clients, your mid-market and your small business, let's look at those. Let's look at the differences. And instead they'll slam all this stuff together Typically, there's not a lot of socialization of said reporting. And the reality is there's gold inside of this data. There is not only can you think about the way that you can compartmentalize it with, with tagging features or creating buckets for the different internal teams. For example, I, I, I use this, this example all the time, Fred, but if you've got 100 pieces of feedback and 20 of them are ripe for sales, 20 of them are ripe for ops, 20 of them are ripe for product, 20 of them are ripe for accounting, and then 20 are ripe for support, Begin to extrapolate that stuff. Show those different individual teams the things that matter to them. Show them some of the granular uh, words that the customer has. But to your point, they went out of their time to give your company feedback and to give your company fuel for improvement. Do something with it, but better yet, send it to the right internal leader. Make sure that you're sending it to the right guy or gal who's going to take the time to actually use that substance. Or directly to the employee. Uh, good employees, if, if they have time and space and they're not afraid for their job and they get feedback from a customer that's legitimate, they can process that and learn from it. So I think some of the coolest tools are ones that just do some AI on the comment and send it directly to the agent. And then, you know, coaching sessions can have, you know, here's one detractor comment, here's one uh, promoter comment, let's talk about what's different, let's listen to the call, what would you do differently? That's a very helpful coaching session as opposed to, well, you're in the bottom quartile, so you better, you get some remedial training here. And, yeah. and that just, I have yet to see a company hold frontline team members accountable for their net promoter score where it didn't just blow up within three or four years as a failed process. It, the, the gaming, the pleading, the manipulate, oh, let's change scores. Net promoter is no good. Let's go to customer effort score. Yeah. What a, an absurd, you know, oh, let's go back to satisfaction. It's not the score. It's the whole way you're doing this. Yep. Don't hold people accountable to a survey it, at the front line. Recognize them for greatness. Spot problems. But, you know, don't say who did it, but let's talk about this as a group and say, you know, how can we get better? And I, I just, uh, I'm astonished. And that's, that's why I came up with Earned Growth. Let's just look at, of all the customers you touched, how many came back for more and bring their friends? Um, you know, we have, the, we have the analytics to do that and stop holding people accountable to a, a score that's done with surveys. Yep, I, 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 think, I think that that makes a ton of sense. And then the other piece to it too is like, for some of our listeners that are thinking about how they can continue to optimize the way that sales and support or sales and customer success or, or sales and customer experience work in concert, you just nailed it, Fred. It's like if, 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 if you've got a hundred person inside CS team and each of them has 200 accounts, if, if those folks can just even pull 10%, right? 10% from each one of their portfolios, you've just given sales a tremendous amount of warm, usable leads to go after because you're basically coming in Number one, you're coming in with a referral, which is the power of the referral is just incredible, Fred. But, but, but the other piece to it too is like, talk about, again, some of that internal optimization and getting teams to work together and, and, and getting sharing the wealth of knowledge too. That's the other big part is so many companies, they just misuse the knowledge inside of their camps and they don't socialize that stuff. And there's so much that you can gain from that. Yeah, so uh, it, if there's only, if there's one thing people, if, if, if there are CX agents listening to this, Get the book chapter that makes it clear that this is a horrible idea. And, and you can, you know, I invented the system. You can probably use that as evidence. We need some change because yep. you do want feedback. If you want to serve customers better, good people need feedback. Absolutely. But the way it's being done today, the car dealers are probably the worst, but it, it's, it's everywhere. It, it's just destroying the, the, the legitimacy of feedback and customers are like, I'm not going to fill out a survey. It's a waste of everybody's time. Yep. Yep. Fred, this has been absolutely fantastic, sir. As we, as we get ready to wrap up the show, I want to make sure, um, number one, um, with, with all of the work that you've done across the world, 
if there was like, if there was like one or two things that you would want to give to uh, one, one or two pieces of advice that you'd want to give to startup founders or to startup executive teams, people that are listening to the show, what would be, what would be the one or two areas that you would tell them to never, um, never take their, their hand off of, or never take their focus off of, regardless of where they're at in their business's success? Well, I, I go back to Andy Taylor. It's something I learned from him, but I've all the great entrepreneurs. Um, I think the guys who founded Warby Parker, very similar idea. You want, when your name is on, when you're a leader, your reputation is what you're building. And yeah, you may make some money along the way. And, uh, but it, the game is to build a reputation that you're proud of. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, linked it back to a, a proverb in the Bible about a good name is worth more than silver or gold. It really is true that and everything you do has to build that reputation. And what is a reputation? It's of every life you touch. Did you enrich it? Did you diminish it? Did you, you know, did you live up to this golden rule of loving thy neighbor or fail? And that's how you build a re reputation, one life at a time. Everything you do as a leader should be oriented toward that moral compass. And, uh, and it's hard in a financial world where all the measurement systems are financial and everyone's trained at business school and financial mindset. But back to the common sense, you're never going to have a great life or a great business unless you live up to that standard of, uh, of treating people right. Couldn't agree more, my friend. Fred, where can people find out more about you, sir? And where can people find out uh, where they can grab their copy of your brand new book? Well, there are a couple, you know, go to LinkedIn and, and look me up. I have a newsletter there that is uh, probably useful if, if you found the podcast interesting. Uh, netpromotersystem.com is Bain's website, which will give you a deeper set of resources and materials, videos and training and so on. And, and, and or you can just go straight to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and get the book and you'll, you'll get some interesting uh, web site uh, details inside that as well. I love it. Well, I'm personally looking forward to diving into it soon, Fred. It's been our absolute pleasure having you come on the show. Thank you so much for joining uh, the CX Chronicles podcast and chatting with the CX Nation today. My pleasure, Adrian. Thank you.